Hello, I'm your host David, and welcome to The Cold War. One of the central anxieties in that tumultuous time in global history was the ever-present threat that the war could go hot at any moment. The resulting nuclear war would devastate much of the Earth. The, the anxiety permeated the... Hey, can you guys hear that? Oh no, what a conveniently timed nuclear strike. Quick, let's look at our archive footage to learn what to do. We interrupt this program. This is a national emergency. Important instructions will follow. Welcome to the Cold War. I'm your host David. If you're watching this, it means that the studio has been hit with a nuclear blast. Still, we're just so dedicated to feeding the relentless content machine that is YouTube that we've prepared in advance this video on the nuclear civil defense system in the United States during the Cold War conflict. Nuclear war is, well, unimaginable because we've never really seen a nuclear strike on humans outside of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945, to which there was no risk of nuclear retaliation since Japan was never a nuclear power. Seeing how much death and destruction that caused, well, we can only imagine what a Cold War nuclear exchange with many more bombs with much higher yields would have. Millions of people were very likely to die, and even those who survived would suffer the effects of acute radiation exposure. Entire regions would be dangerously radioactive for decades, even centuries. That's not even mentioning the fallout or a speculated nuclear winter. So what's a country to do to prepare its citizens for such a wanton level of destruction? In the United States, they developed an entire program of civil defense. In the event of a military attack, the government would lay out instructions for civilians to follow and what to do to keep ready for a potential invasion. You may have heard about this in various countries. Switzerland, for example, is famous for it. But today we are going to talk about the United States and nuclear war. Obviously, no one was really ready to process the destructive power of nuclear conflict. Still, with a more significant threat of a homeland attack, the civil defense needed to step up. The first significant attempt to make a plan for the unthinkable came from the National Security Resources Board. Their job is to give the president advice during wartime for managing people and resources. The result was a document called the Blue Book, not Project Blue Book, which was about UFOs. Hey, Nerlin, should we do a video about UFOs? Hell yeah! Anyway, this was a project put together by experts on what the United States should do in case of nuclear war to protect as many of their citizens as possible. At the very least, they should mitigate the devastation and make sure the US government stays safe and intact. The first major project was really just awareness. Americans in the 1950s didn't actually have much appreciation for just how deadly these weapons were. Introducing children to the reality of nuclear bombs without giving them panic-induced nightmares was quite the task. This is probably the part of the US civil defense you're most familiar with. It's the project which funded films like the famous Bert the Turtle and the Duck and Cover cartoon. The instructions told children that if they saw the flash of a nuclear bomb to get under something, a desk for example, to get away from windows and to close their eyes. This sounds like it would do nothing, and they very well might be, but these efforts did increase their chance of surviving the initial blast. The closed eyes might prevent blindness from the bright light, and the shockwave of the explosion made the finding cover part made sense. However, at that distance, they then got to choose whether to die of burns or radiation sickness. But, you know, A for effort. The real purpose was to introduce the concept of nuclear war to children and to make the reality of what could happen 
to make sense in a way which would not induce panic, or at least cause as little panic as possible. These projects, however, tried so hard not to instruct kids on the real horrific dangers of nuclear war that they seem glib about the realities they talk about. To an almost comical extent today, the entire Fallout series of video games owes its aesthetic to a lot of this educational material. For family homes, the government made educational films and pamphlets on how the average American household could prepare their homes and what to do in case of a nuclear attack. This tried to downplay panic by claiming that atomic weapons can't destroy the earth, that radioactivity was not as harmful as the press made it out to be. They recommended finding a shelter in the basement or in the subway lines to get on the floor flat to dodge debris and cover your face to prevent flash burns. After the initial blast, wait about an hour for some of the radiation to die down and to avoid any non-canned food or unbottled water to prevent contamination. And in a very 1950s gendered move, there was even a special nuclear preparedness for women called the Grandma's Pantry campaign. They literally set out with a program to try and merge, are you serious? Feminine domesticity and paramilitary training. A lot of it seemingly assumes that in the post-nuclear holocaust, we would still maintain strict gender roles. Because of course it did. This program also led to the construction of a system of fallout shelters during the Kennedy administration. They were designed to protect against the effects of radiation and people could hide in them for up to a few years. Thinking about it this way, already it's haunting what reality they are acclimatizing their citizens to. In the early days of the Cold War, say the early 1950s, nuclear bombs would have been dropped by airplanes. Therefore, early detection and preparation was a thing that could happen. But as we move forward in time into ballistic missile territory, this became much more of a challenge. And the possibility of a bomb going off at literally a few minutes notice became much higher. Oh yeah, in case you were wondering what the space race was about, it was to invent better ballistic missiles. But I'm getting a little bit distracted here. All of this is to say that in the early days of the Cold War, if a region or country could get enough warning, evacuating a city before the blast went off could save lives. Still, once we were talking about rockets dropping nuclear payloads, that plan became less feasible. That's from about the late 1950s onwards. The US government also put out a project to save what was most important to them, itself. All of the procedures and redundancies to keep Air Force One in the sky in case of a nuclear attack, to even the whole designated survivor thing they, they made a bad TV show about, comes from projects to ensure that the government would continue in some capacity if the worst was to happen. I'd go into more depth on the details, but as you can guess, much of it's still kept secret today. But there are nuke-proof mountain fortresses in northeastern Virginia and Maryland designed to house the government. And how would they detect such attacks? The US started a project to reform communication systems to make sure they were ready in case of an attack. That signal we showed at the beginning of the video, that signal is supposed to be followed by an emergency broadcast with essential information. The US also installed a network of Thunderbolt sirens known as air raid sirens. They could have been used in case of nuclear war, but has actually had a side benefit in helping with natural disasters, especially tornadoes. The US used to run drills and test a nuclear strike, though some opposed it because baked into all these defense systems was an assumption that people would survive. Those against testing emergency plans argued that the only way to prevent death from a nuclear war was to avoid an exchange in the first place. And you know what, they were probably right. Studies done by the US military, especially war game simulations, found diminishing returns of these defense initiatives. Their recommendations by the 1960s turned to missile defense and interception, at least from a cost-benefit analysis. The number of missiles began to climb and the ability to mitigate deaths with these procedures were inadequate. So what would uh, these efforts actually accomplish? 
Well, maybe not much, but it would be seen as the United States doing something to protect its citizens in a period of growing anxiety. The appearance of safety and security would diminish calls to ramp down the Cold War, maybe, or make more effort to stop the growing stockpile of nuclear bombs. It's security theater. Remember how after 9-11, people were anxious and scared? Oh, wait, some of you were Zoomers, so maybe I should stop assuming and explain. After 9-11, there was a lot of fear and anxiety, which led to people purchasing a bunch of chemical weapons suits or other forms of home security to do something to make it appear the government was doing something to keep the people safe. The US started the Department of Homeland Security and the TSA. Yes, studies have shown the TSA does very little to make flying actually safe, but they sure do make it look like they're making flying safe. These haunting messages and procedures show a light to the Cold War that some of our older viewers might appreciate but the younger ones might not. The Cold War was a legitimately dangerous time for, well, the species. Actually, all species. Two empires had, and still have, weapons of apocalyptic magnitude, which a diplomatic breakdown, a desperate situation, or heck, even a technical mishap, could wipe out a large segment of the global population. So, have fun sleeping tonight. We hope you've enjoyed tonight's coverage, and to make sure you don't miss future episodes, please make sure you subscribe to our channel and have pressed the bell button. We can be reached via email at thecoldwarchannel at gmail.com. We're also active on Facebook and Instagram at The Cold War TV. If you would like to help us turn the studio into a vault tech vault so we can survive the apocalypse, consider supporting us via www.patreon.com slash thecoldwar or join our membership via YouTube. This is the Cold War channel, and don't forget, the trouble with the Cold War is that it doesn't take too long before it becomes heated.